director, right? There's not always that we get the opportunity to get an animation like that. So, but on my presentation today, I'm going to focus on the commercial perspective on composable commerce. It's one of the fastest moving trends that we see right now. A lot of companies is looking into this. I'll, I'll stay away. I'll try to stay as much away from the technical explanations and just focus on what is the relevancy for business leaders around this. So I'll, I'll give you a quick round on, rundown of what it is, what it's trying to solve, and what kind of businesses that can get value out of it. But with that, also identifying who this would could potentially be just a trap and just drain resources and investments. A lot of things is, is happening in this space. But, and in the end, I'll wrap up with five pragmatic tips on how can you get you know, a step further and really evaluating whether this is interesting for you or not. But before we go into the concept of composable architecture, we first need just to understand a little bit about the customer experience evolution over the years. So if we jump to the mid uh, 2000s, companies offered a very single channel experience, even though that digital was picking up, it was still very isolated. So you can just take the practical example of e-banking. So you could do a lot of things online, but some things you still had to go to the bank counter, right? So if you had to sign documents and so on. And for those that did e-commerce, e it was very siloed and was not really connected into the main business model. And just remember, this is back when Apple launched the first uh, iPhone, where it was kind of, you know, with a touch display and so on. So we're talking still like a, a while back. And then if we move a little bit into that omnichannel era, which was starting around 2012, 13, when that started to, to pick up, it was really pushed by the increased growth of consumer e com and also the adoption on smartphones in general. So retailers started to launch initiatives, programs, and really quite transformational programs to offer an omnichannel experience. And we're talking just the basics back then. It was just like, how do we create feature, like price and assortment parity across our e-commerce solution and our stores? It was quite a big challenge today, even though that we can look back at it and, and laugh a little bit. But what we're, where we're moving now and moving into this decade, Digital customer experience have evolved quite a bit. And of course, businesses have been investing into digital quite a lot and everything has been accelerated due to the pandemic as well. But today, it's not just a matter of offering products on multiple channels on your own website and stores, Amazon and so on, but it's also about really having this deep customer understanding and being able to orchestrate relevant experiences at the right place and the right time regardless of the channel and, and, the, and, the, and the touch point. And what we clearly see as well is that consumers and users have more touch point than ever. And this is just going to constantly evolve as we move on. There's going to be more options for consumers and users to engage with. So for that reason, the champions and the industry leaders of tomorrow's is the ones that really get this business agility that is able to rapidly optimize the core business model, do what they do great, just better, or even transform into new opportunities, opening new sales channels, opening new services. And that is really due to that increased market um, change that we've seen. We've seen markets becoming more global. It's easier to sell across borders. But we also see, of course, the constant changing buying behavior, like consumers in, in interacting differently now. And all of this, of course, needs to be delivered you know, with a value-creating customer experience. As I said before, it's, it's not just about the product anymore. It's actually about the more the experience or the problem that you're solving. And it also needs to be supported through connected data and intelligence. So this constant change and evolution puts a lot of pressure on the backbone of your business. And of course, also on the tech stack that you're using, like how do we make sure that, that is supporting that? And that's becoming more complex, it's becoming larger, and it's becoming more business critical. And for some companies, they face the challenge right now that that's actually the biggest bottleneck that they have. It's not the opportunities, but it's like how fast can we execute? How fast can we go to market with these things? And then they look at the IT team and they're just struggling to keep up with the things that they have on their hands already. So the composable architecture concept is by heart designed to address some of those challenges and basically support a constant evolving business need. So with that a little bit, I want to go, even though I'll try to stay away from the technical things, I still need to give you a high level introduction to what it is. So I just want to start looking at what we kind of call platform-based architecture. And that's the platforms you have in the market is the Adobe Commerce of the world, Salesforce, Epi Server, and so on, where you kind of get a platform 
that is built uh, on a concept with a large set of pre or well-proven out-of-the-box features. So you can get going with it quite fast. And of course, this can be customized to individual business needs um, as well. But if we compare this to the composable uh, architecture or the microservice-based architecture, this is really based on this microservice concept where different services and features are divided into agnostic building blocks. So these building blocks can operate independently from each other. So just an image here, if you take a hammer and you kind of kind of smash this kind of platform-based architecture into small bits and pieces. Just to use another comparison here, you can compare this to a more visual way to compare this, like just with an iMac and a cost to build PC. The platform-based architecture follows a set of principles and the architecture is already set or predefined by a vendor and say, okay, this is how the architecture looks like high level. It's usually part of a large ecosystem, which comes with a lot of benefits, such as ease of integration in that ecosystem, shared data models and pre-built features, just as you know it from the Apple ecosystem, if we just have to stay within that reference. It does serve a lot of benefits and value for money if your needs fit within that system. Right? So the system can, of course, be customized, but like with an iMac or Mac, you will reach a certain point we cannot customize the system anymore, or the cost of, of that will be too high. And that's usually where we see companies going into replatform, and that current replatforming life cycles is between five to eight years. That's where we especially see brands and retailers, they, they, they say, we have a changing need, and the platform that we went with five years ago is not fitting our need today, so we need a whole new platform. If we then compare this to the composable architecture, this is more built on this set of building blocks where you're able to add, replace, enhance specific parts of your system just as you go. It gives you endless flexibility and makes it possible for you to really sub-optimize every part of your system and work on a more granular level with your architecture, completely avoiding this big replatform project that might take out one to two years of your business every time that it happens. So really being able to say, do I need to have a bigger, just to stay in, in an example here, I, I want to have a bigger hard drive, you can just take it out and you can replace it with something else. But with that custom PC, it's just exactly the same. It's just, it does require a higher level of technical competence and architecting to make sure that it's still the right building blocks that is put together. Another comparison we usually see is using like Playmobil to describe the platform-based architecture. You can do something that could be custom, but on the other side, you have uh, the Lego bricks that is pre-made and you can put them together in countless of, um, of combis, right? So if you want to build a small Lego car or want to build a plane, it's the same building bricks that you use for it, but they serve different purposes. Another aspect uh, of this from uh, the business side is really how the technology is built and maintained. With a platform-based architecture, there's usually one team working on the platform. So you go to a partner that implement this platform for you. While this creates a lot of clear accountability and good overview of the system, it could also have drawbacks since the whole system is kind of intertwined with some dependencies between you know, the different functions of the system. With a microservice-based architecture, you can divide members, teams, or work between multiple partners with the clear like, separation of responsibilities. So for example, you could have one partner just maintaining your kind of your pricing and your catalog services. You might have services that you do in-house yourself and say, okay, this is our customer daily uh, data, mo uh, data model service that we use across all our channels that we have a team working with internally. So what this really means is it gives you, especially when you reach a certain size, it does give you this possibility to scale better, uh, basically having more people working on the platform and giving you a faster time uh, time to market. So you can compare this to if you're building your house. There's only a certain amount of people that you can have working on the ground on your house, but if all things was pre-built before it arrived and it was just a matter for you to assemble it, you'll be able to build houses faster. So talking about a little bit of speed and size and, and what is a good fit, the, we made this very simplified diagram, and of course there are exceptions to it, but generally, you can look at it from two different dimensions. So you have revenue and size, and you have the complexity of the business model. So if you're selling T-shirts with prints and have 20 orders per day, 
composable commerce and composable architecture is really not for you. It must be too high technical cost and cost that you have to invest into it. But if you're a marketplace or you're a manufacturer with a very complex products and you have IoT services, you want to surface into a digital portal, you might have digital tools, or you want to have your sales reps being able to use, you know, have data from your CM system shown into this portal. Or you are very like if you're a large retailer with a lot of different stores, or you're a global brand that operates across many different countries. Maybe different countries having different level of e- e-commerce. Some countries might have integration into local stores. There's a lot of benefits um, in this presentation that I that I that I talked about here today. One of the exceptions where we see composable, headless, and microservice-based architectures still does have a little bit of attraction, even though it doesn't really not match into this diagram. It is for those companies that have an existing business model where the transactional commerce part was just going to be a small part of it. So that could, for example, be newspapers that just want to say, okay, we need to make sure that we can transact what people are paying and make sure that we have a service that we're able to give them access to the right content. But the main business model is really to distribute and create content Right. Or we also see the example of um, uh, IoT services. So um, a lot of the car uh, car companies today are actually using this architecture to to power some of the add-on services that you can buy in your car. So whenever you if you buy a new car today, a lot of them they offer you to unlock additional services or, or hardware in the car. When you do that, that needs to communicate with something that says, okay, now there's a purchase happening. This will then unlock a service. And this is kind of where this does not become the core of the system, but it sits on the side. Another exception could be direct-to-consumer companies that have an existing business model where it could make sense for them to build this on the side with some microservice, say, okay, we only get the data out of the existing ecosystem that, that, that we need, or we might just tap into what's, uh, what's already there. So I know that I'm painting a picture that is not really black and white, and that's sometimes what makes this a bit difficult because there's no real answer. You cannot just fill out a survey and say, this is the right fit for me. But what we're really looking at when we have these talks with, 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 with companies is three different things. We look at what is, this, what, is the, what is the fit in terms of the operating model? What industry are they in? Is there a big likelihood that there will be a lot of change in the industry? We also look at the company itself. So do they have the digital capabilities to support this? Do they understand? Do they have architects internally, like digital product owners? And do they have experience with this as well? One of the things that happens is your ownership of this is moving more away from external to internal, which is fine if this becomes really, you know, part of your strategy. The last thing is, of course, that we look at what's already in place. A lot of companies already heading towards this best of breed, composable architecture one way or another, and this would fit into that. So with that, um, I hope I've given you some insights and food for thought. I'm not going to just leave you off the hook just yet, because I also just want to give you like five tips for you to consider. So first one is really, and it goes with a lot of these things that happens in tech, is recognize that this is not really a silver bullet. There's many ways to achieve goals. And yes, this could be one of them, but there's also different ways. And of course, this also has both pros and cons. Start with the why. Like you need to start from the business need and then tech needs to support that. It's not working the other way around. So what is your what is your goals? What is your challenges? What is the opportunities that you see in your business? Understand your current capabilities. So this is a very technical topic. So you need to have technical people internally that will be able to take ownership of whatever is created. As I said before, you have the possibility to create the Lego plane, the Lego boat, but you need somebody to understand, is it a boat or is it the plane that we're building? And some of that responsibility needs to sit inside the company. I can just advise you to talk to people. This is a trend. In, it's a lot of things happening in, in this area at the moment, and it's also quite new. So the more people you talk with, you get different point of views and you get different insights. So I can just recommend to talk to different people just to get it from different angles. And if you decide to move forward, the the microservice and the composable architecture is a very good candidate for proof of concepts and a very agile way of working. So you don't have to replace everything you have overnight. You can actually do it in step. And it goes back to this kind of component-based architecture where you can just say, okay, now we actually just serve the orders. 
So we use the existing that we have, but now all this is, is flowing through this system. Then we take the next step. We might take content. We might take pricing and so on. So you can kind of lift it one by one slowly instead of going in with this big bang uh, uh, replatform project. That might be a very, very um, a tough thing to do. So with these five tips, I hope I've given you some guidance to make it a little bit easier to navigate, you know, what is all this composable architecture really about? And I would thank you for your time. And, you know, please remember to come by our digital booth in the platform. Um, feel free to book any meeting or reach out to us. Um, we are here uh, online all day today. So if you have the time, make sure that you use it.